DeepSeek's low-cost AI model was a major wake-up call to the industry, sparking some skepticism around the billions that big tech has invested and continues to invest in artificial intelligence. Here to help us make sense of this all, we want to bring in Zach Acas. He's a former open AI go-to-market executive. And Zach, you're the perfect person to discuss this with because I think a lot of us are trying to figure out just how effective, how deep seek stacks up to some of the technology that we do have here, specifically with open AI, but also just how we should be thinking about big tech spend when it comes to AI. How are you making sense of that? Well, okay, so first what I'll say is, um, if you uh, care about AI progress and scientific progress, mm -hmm. this is a win. And I think it just has to be called out. Deep seek the app, which is unnerving, uh, given the, the geopolitical right. tensions. Sure. Let's set that aside. DeepSeek R1, the model itself, is a breakthrough. I mean, you, you, you have to see it as such. Being excited about progress in science is something that we should all want. And seeing the cost of a critical resource come down is also something we should want. The market capitulation with NVIDIA, I'm not even sure it makes that much sense. Because in a world where AI becomes less expensive, we will want more GPUs. Um, now, I'm, I'm not offering investment advice, but I will say that I, I see this as a win. And, and it's, a, it's bothersome that it comes out of China, and it's bothersome that it upsets our idea of how many chips we might need. Driving down the cost of a critical resource is something that we want in the human experience. And, and so is it a win because then AI is essentially more accessible, so we get better at using it and find new use cases? What, what makes it a win? All the above. I mean, two weeks ago, you know, I, I was in Davos and a bunch of people cornered me to say, what about the environmental costs of AI? Today, we suddenly figured out, okay, we might need less GPUs and less energy as a result to mm. produce this stuff. And of course, now that's upsetting for other reasons. But my reminder to everyone is, in a world where we need something, and in this case, we're probably moving towards a world where we need AI to make progress to, to build n new economic systems, we want to make it as inexpensive as possible. And Optimally, we want, to, we want to live in a world where it's distributed by lots of providers. We don't actually want to live in a world where one model rules them all, and this is evidence that we will live in a multi-model future, where, in fact, many LLMs will be able to serve lots of different purposes. Does this change the winner-loser dynamic within the AI industry? Well, it depends on what, you know. Who... It doesn't sound like, I was going to say, you're actually making the argument where I actually don't think it really does. My struggle with all this is people, you know, it, it, every, we have this recency bias. Yeah. So we wake up one morning and we go, oh, R1 has changed our understanding of how many chips we need. But in fact, what it's done is reminded us that, that the, this thing, AI, these really powerful models, can get much more cost efficient, which was a major concern, if you recall, four months ago. I mean, the, yeah. the thing that everyone was talking about is, how do we drive down the cost? How do we make sure we don't live in a technological hegemony? How do we make sure we don't destroy the environment? Well, we just got an answer that, in fact, the scaling laws may not apply. I think the market is the winner. I mean, I look at this as like, look, of course, it changes paradigms, and it, it sort of disrupts what people thought was the normal, and markets react to that sort of suddenly. Right. But in a world where you want a ton of AI that's low cost, this really is the best thing that could have happened. Does it change the spending paradigm, though, for the big tech companies? Specifically, I'm talking about the hyperscalers, right? Meta out last night saying they spent, they plan to spend 60 to 65 billion on CapEx this year. That's a big number, and that number isn't, go I mean, we just got these developments this week too, right? But does it change the overall spending story for some of the largest companies? Well, so you, you saw Mark's comments last night or this morning. Yeah. He was like, unless things change, yeah. we're still gonna commit this money. <laughs> things just changed. But I also will say, if AI actually, Jevons Paradox says, mm -hmm. the less expensive a resource is, the more we consume of it. And if you had told an energy provider 50 years ago that the cost per kilowatt of energy today would be what it is, they would have said, oh, we don't want to be in this space. Sure. All that happened when we made energy cheap is we lit everything up, right? We just, we consume a bunch of it and it's a good time to be an energy provider. And so what I would say to people is, sure, chips may fluctuate in terms of demand, but our consumption of AI is almost certainly going to go up as a result of this. And if you are a consumer or a provider of the technology, you probably win as a result. And that's what we've heard from a lot of the larger tech CEOs too over the last couple of days. I'm curious, how do you think, or what do you think the conversations are like then at OpenAI right now? Mm -hmm. Or when you take a look at Anthropic, just in terms of this development and ultimately maybe that's adding obviously serious question marks just in terms of what their business is going to look like in the short term. 
Yeah, so I won't speak to you know what it might be specifically at OpenAI, but if I worked in a, you know a model a model manufacturer today, what I would try to do is remember and remind my colleagues that our value is probably not in the frontier model research, and I think that this is an important thing that the market is going to start to appreciate. That in fact. If you believe in OpenAI, and I do very much for all sorts of reasons, you believe in it probably as a product and application company more so than a research company per se. Mm -hmm. Because we live in a world now where we're probably approaching a, a scientific evolutionary convergence where everyone starts to get access to the research at around the same time. And there's a ton of historical precedent for this, by the way. But I do think that it is an important reminder that the application layer matters more than anything else. That how you deliver the technology is the critical differentiator. And this has basically been a, you know, a truism for a while. It's just, you know, we're reverting back to that mean where people go, oh, maybe we won't actually differentiate because we have a frontier model. Maybe we differentiate because we have an app that's installed on everyone's phone, or we have the best agents that connect to other agents. Mm. Zach, I'm curious then as some of the works in the space when we talk about this sort of growing of AI use cases and everyone maybe being able to access it a little bit more, what's the killer use case we haven't seen yet or something that you feel like AI can do that we haven't really been seeing yet that you mm. think will start to maybe drive the general consumer toward AI? Well, I would say that I think the general consumer is driven towards AI at this point. I mean, the, yeah, the number of sure. apps, the number of AI native apps that are installed on our, our, ours and our friends' devices at this point is pretty incredible. Um, it's certainly faster growth than we've seen in basically any category in digital ever. That being said, if you're waiting for a killer app, it's going to be agentive AI. You are, it, you, we are going to quickly move towards a world where let's say you're 20 or 30% more productive today because of your apps. In six months, a year, we will probably be 50 to 100% more productive because of our agentive technology. And that is going to be the moment where people realize, oh, you know what, I'm actually doing less on my device, mm. and AI is doing more on my behalf. Mm. In addition, I think we are about to see massive moves in categories adjacent to AI. Everyone's like, oh, what's the best AI stock? I'm like, yeah, fine, pick an AI stock, I guess. <laughs> Bio life sciences, education, healthcare, these categories that are rate limited by human intelligence, mm. that have incredible inefficiencies in them that we invest in because they just are necessary to the world, but actually have a bunch of you know, mm. fuzz on them. These categories are going to see some massive growth pretty soon, and I'm not actually sure that that's priced effectively yet. Mm, a lot for uh, our audience to think about. Zach, we really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah.